Hello. So this is a book that I like. And so I'm going to read it in a series of videos. Chapter 1 is called The Hunter. Once upon a time, long, long ago, where the forest runs down to the ocean, a hunter lived all alone in a house made of logs he had chopped for himself and shingles he had split for himself. The house had one room, and at the end closest to the ocean there was a fireplace of pink and gray and green boulders. The hunter had carried them home in his arms from the cliff where the forest ended. On the crushed seashells of the floor there were deer skins and seal skins, and on the bed was the skin of a big black bear. Hanging on the wall, over the bed, were the hunter's bows and arrows. The hunter, a big brown-faced man with a fair hair and a fair beard, wore trousers and a shirt and shoes of creamy deerskin. His silvery-gray cloak was made of the hide of a mountain lion, and the cap he wore when it rained or snowed was the skin of a sea otter. Over the fireplace hung a big brass hunting horn he had found in a wreck the waves washed ashore. He had carved some of the logs of the walls and some of the planks of the chairs into foxes and seals, a lynx and a mountain lion. When he sat by the logs blazing in the fireplace, the room looked half golden with firelight and half black with the shadow of the firelight and the logs would roar and crackle so loudly that they drowned out the sound of the waves on the beach below. But when the logs had burnt to embers, and the embers had burnt away to coals, the man would lie in his bed, warm under the bearskin, and listen to the great soft sound the waves made over and over. It seemed to him that it was like his mother singing, and before he could remember that his father and mother were dead and that he lived there all alone, he had drifted off to sleep. And in his sleep, his mother sat by the bed, singing. His father sat at the fireplace, waxing his bowstring or mending his long white arrows. In the spring, the meadow that ran down from the cliff to the beach was all foam white and sea blue with flowers. The hunter looked at it, and it was beautiful. But when he came home, there was no one to tell what he had seen. And if he picked the flowers and brought them home in his hands, there was no one to give them to. And when at evening, past the dark blue shape of a far-off island, the sun sank under the edge of the sea like a red world vanishing, the hunter saw it all. But there was no one to tell what he had seen. One winter night, as he looked at the stars that, blazing coldly, made the belt and sword of the hunter Orion, a great green meteor went slowly across the sky. The hunter's heart leapt. He cried, Look! Look! But there was no one to look. One evening, he was lying on his bed. The soft summer breeze blew in through his open door and the moonlight lay on the floor by the window like the skin of a white bear. The hunter thought. After a while his thoughts changed to dreams, and his mother was singing to him. But all at once his eyes were open, and he was awake, and he could still hear someone singing. He got up and went down through the meadow to the sea. The tide was out. He walked over the warm, wet sand, and the warm, soft waves ran to his feet and died away, whispering in little foaming scallops, like the scales of a fish. Out at the seal rocks, hidden in their shadow, something was singing in a soft voice, like a woman's. The song had words, but no words the hunter had ever heard before, and the song itself was different from any he had ever heard. 
He listened for a long time. The song ended on a long, low note, and then everything was silent except the sea, whose shallow silver waves made a little hushing sound and were silent for an instant, and then said, Hush! again. The hunter called to the singer. From the rock's shadow he heard a quick scrambling noise, then the sound of something diving into the water, the sound the seals always made. Shading his eyes with his hands, the hunter stared into the moonlight around the shadow of the rocks, but there was nothing to see, and now nothing to hear. After a while, he went home. The next night, when he heard the voice singing and went down to the shore and listened till its new song was over and then called softly to it, the singer dived into the water just as before. But this time, as the hunter stared into the moonlight around the rocks, a sleek, wet head came up out of the water, staring at him with shining eyes, and then sank back under and was gone. It was nothing he had ever seen before. Its long, shining hair and shining skin were the same silvery blue-green, the color of the moonlight on the water. As he walked home over the sand of the beach and the grasses of the meadow, the hunter sang to himself over and over the last notes of the mermaid's song. All the next day, no matter what he did, he hummed them. Sometimes he would forget them for a few moments and be for and be afraid he had forgotten them for good, but they always came back to him. That night, when the moon rose, the hunter went down to the beach, sat at the edge of the water, and began to sing. He sang, one by one, all the songs he knew, and between each song and the next, he would sing what he remembered of the mermaid's song. He kept looking towards the seal rocks. There was nothing. But after a while, out past the first white line of the waves, a wet head. Slowly, so as not to frighten her, he turned away. He went on singing. When he had almost finished the song, he turned his head a little, and then a little more, till out of the corner of his eye he could see that she had come closer. The moonlight glistened on her hair and on the wet curves of her shoulders. Staring at her sideways, he sang her her own song, but when he was almost at the end, he stopped in the middle of a note. There was silence for a moment, then he heard a little soft laugh. The mermaid sang him the last notes of the song, and before he could speak or move, she was gone. Her head and shoulders slid under the water so smoothly that one minute she was there, and the next she had vanished without a sound, almost without a ripple. The hunter had lived so long with animals that he himself was as patient as an animal. He waited a long time and then went home. He was not disappointed that she had gone, only certain that she would be back. He kept remembering how the laugh and the last notes of the song had sounded. When he was so nearly asleep that he could hardly tell whether he was remembering them or hearing them, he was still certain that she would be back. After he fell fast asleep, neither thinking nor dreaming, he still smiled. And the next night, and the next, and the next, and the next, she was there. She came closer now, sitting in the shallow water, the waves not up to her waist. She talked to the hunter in a voice like the water, in a voice that made no more sense to the hunter than the water. No word of hers was like any word of his. They began to teach each other words. The mermaid would touch her head and make the same sound over and over till the hunter had memorized it. Then he would pat his leg and say, Leg! Leg! And the mermaid, looking as if a leg were a very queer thing either to have or to have a word for, would repeat the word in her liquid voice. But she could say his sounds so much better than he could say hers, remember his words so much better than he could remember hers, that before long the learning was all one way. The hunter said her words awkwardly and ruefully, like something learned too late, but she said his like an old magician learning a new trick, 
a trick almost too easy for her to need to learn. The hunter said to her, bewildered, You never make mistakes. What is mistakes? The wrong word, the wrong sound, one you don't mean to make, the way I do. Mistakes are what I make when I try to talk the way you talk. The mermaid repeated in a satisfied voice, Mistakes. She had one more word. She told the hunter that the others, like her, used to come in as far as the seal rocks, but had stopped now that he was on the beach every night. She said, The sea... Then she stopped at a loss for the next word and said, You are a man. What is two? What is three? Men. The sea men, like me, the sea people. The sea people, like me, are afraid of land. Not me. Oh, not me. They think I... Here she hesitated and then said triumphantly, Make mistakes. Make bad mistakes. They say all good comes from the sea. She struck the water with a cheerful, scornful hand. Why don't you think that? The mermaid immediately told him, but in her language, not his. He laughed. She laughed and wrinkled her nose and forehead, searching for the words, but they wouldn't come. So she said, Oh, well. Whenever she didn't know what to say or how to say it, she would exclaim cheerfully, Oh, well. The hunter couldn't remember ever teaching her to say it, but she'd certainly learned. But the next night, she had her answer. Her first words were, The land is new. The hunter gave her a puzzled look. She said swiftly, They say all good comes from the sea, but the land is new. The land is... Here she said one of her own words, then asked impatiently, You have legs, I have not legs. The moon is white, the sky is black. What is that? Different? Different. The land is different. Sometimes the land was so different that the mermaid would learn a word in a few seconds and after half an hour's explanation still not know what it meant. One day, the mermaid came to the beach in the daytime now, the hunter pointed up over the meadow and said in a clear divided tones of a teacher making something plain, That is my house. House, hissed the mermaid. House. I sleep in the house on a bed. I eat in the house on a table. Bed, said the mermaid. Table. But her quick eyes looked strange and hesitant. It was plain that she had no idea what the hunter was talking about. The hunter started cheerfully. A table's a big flat things with legs. The mermaid's eyes brightened. She knew what legs meant and felt very landish for knowing. That you eat on. Why do you get on it to eat? Oh no, you don't get on it. You put what you're going to eat on it. Why? Well, otherwise you'd have to hold it in your hands. You don't want to hold it in your hands? The hunter went on. Then besides the table there's a bed. That's a big flat thing. Oh yes, like a table. Well, not like a table exactly. It's made of wood like that log there, and it has a bear skin on it and you sleep in it. The log was hollow. As she looked at it, the mermaid saw you took the log and put a skin around it, then got inside it and went to sleep. Ugh, she said, said the mermaid. I understand the bed. The bed and the table are both inside the house. The house is a big hollow thing. Like the bed? No, the bed's not hollow. Then I don't understand the bed. We'll come back to the bed. The house is a big wooden thing, see how big it is, that you stay inside at night or when it rains. Why? To keep from getting wet. To keep from getting wet, the mermaid said despairingly. At once the hunter had an idea. It's like a ship, he cried. Wouldn't it be nice if, instead of just sleeping anywhere, every night you sw swam inside that wrecked ship out by the reef and slept there, and you could stay in it when it rained? The mermaid said softly in utter amazement. That's the queerest thing I've ever heard in all my life. You're... You've made a mistake. You must have made a mistake. 
but usually whatever the hunter did or said had for the mermaid the glamour of land. She loved it when she, he shot for her, and would run her hand along the dark bow and white feathery arrows. As she tugged at an arrow shot into driftwood from across the beach, she said admiringly, I think you could kill anything. One day the hunter was sitting, fishing. She swam up and said in a pleased, puzzled voice, she loved learning about things, What are you doing? Fishing. The mermaid looked more puzzled than before. So the hunter explained in several sentences how he did it. She looked at him unbelievingly and then burst into laughter. What are you laughing at? asked the hunter. It's... It's such a roundabout way of catching fish. What do you want me to do? Swim after them and catch them in my mouth? You're the only thing I know that doesn't catch them that way. You look so helpless just sitting there waiting for one. Tell me what sort of sort you want and I'll get it for you. For a moment, the hunter felt a child's humiliation. But then he laughed and told her the sort of fish he wanted and the mermaid got it for him. The next day, he brought her a piece of venison, which she took one bite of and threw away. But the day after, he brought her a branch of red maple leaves. The mermaid looked at it as if she couldn't believe it. She carried it and stroked it and said to him lovingly, It's the best thing I've ever had in all my life. Oh, you're so lucky to live on land, land so, so. But for the first day, time in many days, she couldn't think of the word she wanted, and said, as she had once said so often, Oh well. By now the mermaid and the hunter were spending most of their time together. His house got to have a random, half-lived-in look, and he hunted mechanically for the next meal or two. The mermaid was used to the meadow now, and she would sit, he and she would sit in the tan fall grass, looking out over the seal rocks to the island, and she would say triumphantly, I am a hundred and fifty steps from the ocean. A hundred and fifty of your steps from the ocean. Do you think any of the others have ever been so far up on the land? Any of them? Oh, no, if they saw me now, they'd say, she laughed and used her old word, what a mistake you've made! Oh, what a mistake you've made! Mistake or not, the mermaid had made it. But that fall she went into the house with the table and the bed, and from then on the sea people saw her only as a visitor from the land that was so, so, whatever it was.